Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions about the topic today, you can email or call our speaker with the contact information you'll see on our last slide. And this is just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. We do offer advertising, so you can email me if you would like more information on that. And our speaker today is Jennifer Short. She's going to be covering False Claims Act, Basics, and Big Picture. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really happy to be with you today to talk about the False Claims Act. Uh, it's good for those of us who really get into the weeds of these cases uh, to go back to basics and remind ourselves of what this law is all about. Um, so can I get the first slide? All right. So th this first slide just highlights some of the recent False Claims Act matters that have been in the news in just the last three months. Um, and for this audience, we've tried to focus on matters that involve government contractors. So you'll see here um, Cisco Systems has reportedly reached a settlement uh, involving cybersecurity weaknesses in its video surveillance software. ITT Cannon resolved allegations that it failed to properly test electrical connectors that it was selling to the Department of Defense. Uh, and Informatica settled claims that it gave misleading information to IT resellers about the product discounts that it gave to commercial customers. So you can see the sort of a broad range of issues that pop up. These are all False Claims Act settlements. The, the headline that I omitted in that summary is the, the big dollar case here, uh, the healthcare fraud case, the $1.4 billion settlement that Reckitt ben, Benkiser uh, entered into last month. Um, this shows how astronomical the damages calculations can be in these cases. So in the past couple of decades, um, the healthcare fraud cases tend to, to dominate the news because of those very, very large recoveries. Um, but this is an area, as you can see, that, that government contractors um, are active targets of government investigations and settlements. Um, so this is just to, uh, supposed, to be, supposed to be a an attention grabbing uh, headline. Our goals for the next 20 minutes or so. I want to give you a history of the False Claims Act so you understand what policies and ideas have motivated this law and how do we get to these kinds of results. We'll go over the basic elements of the act, what constitutes a violation, what does the statute actually say, and then talk a few minutes about how it works in practice. And finally, what I want everyone to walk away with is an understanding of why this act is so significant for government co contractors. Why do we keep talking about it time and time again? So if we could get to the next slide, we will focus on how, I want everyone to think about how government contracting concerns sort of been intertwined in the development of this law. So this is the, the history of the False Claims Act piece. Um, it's referred to sometimes as Lincoln's Law because it was enacted way back in 1863. It's a very old law. Uh, it was enacted in response to fraud that was occurring during the Civil War where people were selling equipment to the Union Army. Um, some examples that are touted um, frequently, uh, there were sawdust-filled boxes that were supposed to contain guns. Um, somebody was out there selling horses multiple times to the Army. Um, so this law came about because of um, a, a desire to, to address that contractor fraud. Um, so when you go back to that first iteration of the False Claims Act, way back in 1863, there were what was called key TAM provisions. And you'll hear this as people are talking about this law, they'll say key TAM or qui TAM. Um, it's all the, the same shorthand for a very long Latin phrase that I will not try to um, 
repeat, uh, but the phrase means one who brings an action for the king as for himself. So uh, in the False Claims Act context, key TAM plaintiffs are also known as relators, so you'll hear that terminology. And then more colloqu colloquially, you'll hear the term whistleblower. Um, and there are a number of federal laws uh, that address whistleblowers um, here, the whistleblowers that we're talking about uh, are principally people, typically insiders, who are blowing the whistle, uh, bringing the government's attention to a fraud uh, being committed on the U.S. government fisc. So our prime targets uh, in the False Claims Act are government contractors, healthcare providers, grant recipients. Uh, and the like, and the whistleblowers are um, those among us who uh, see something going wrong and decide that um, it is worth it to try to bring the government's attention to this issue by filing uh, a lawsuit on behalf of the government. So in practice, this means, again, somebody who is aware that the, the False Claims Act is being violated can file a lawsuit on behalf of the United States, and they file the lawsuit against the person or company that is committing the violation. Um, important here, this is a lawsuit for money, and the, the goal is to recover what the government paid out because of the fraud or because of the FCA violations. So the relator is, can recover money on behalf of the United States. Uh, most of the recovery goes to the government because the government is the entity that has paid out too much or suffered the damage because of the violations of the act. Um, but again, going back to the very first uh, iteration of the False Claims Act, um, those key TAM provisions in the original act offered a bounty so that the relator, the key TAM relator or whistleblower, in the first version of this act could get up to 50% of the recovery that was gained through this lawsuit. So that gave a powerful incentive for people to come forward and make all sorts of allegations. There was the pendulum swung uh, 50 or so years, 50, 60 or so years after the act was first um, uh, came into being. And the false claimed False Claims Act was amended in 1943, and the bounty provision, that 50% recovery for the key TAM relator, was reduced significantly. And not surprisingly, fewer cases were brought. Then in 1984, through a whistleblower, uh, a whistleblower brought a case against General Electric. And in that case, the whistleblower uh, was a former GE employee who alleged that the company was submitting false bills to the Department of Defense on the B-1 Lancer bomber contract. And this case brought a lot of attention back to the False Claims Act, and it prompted substantial amendments to the False Claims Act in 1986. So the 1986 amendments to the False Claims Act really ushered in um, the modern era of False Claims Act importance. So that's the era that, that most people focus on and most people are talking about when they talk about um, the False Claims Act. So in those 86 amendments, the, the bounty provisions, the relator share was increased. It, it went to a range of now 15 to 30 percent, depending on what happens to the case. Um, it increased the, the damages provision, so a violation had uh, more severe consequences, and it added some whistleblower protection provisions um, so that whistleblowers um, could come forward without fear of retaliation, or if they were retaliated against, then they would also have uh, their own.
recovery in history, um, that figure obviously has now been eclipsed many times over. So a little more history lesson, healthcare fraud became a focus in the mid-1990s. So up until um, the post, the, sort of the modern era um, of the False Claims Act statutes, the focus really was on government contractors and procurement. And then in the mid-1990s, by government policy, um, there was a program, a pilot program announced called Operation Restore, Restore Trust. And the idea there was to get federal and state law enforcement to team up with the Medicare and Medicaid agencies to combat fraud, waste, and abuse in healthcare spending. So this had a huge impact on enforcement efforts and recoveries and the case law that was developed, the, the court law that was developed under the False Claims Act. The statute itself didn't change because of Operation Restore Trust. Likewise, uh, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005 also didn't amend the False Claims Act, but it did provide incentives to the states to pass their own versions of the False Claims Act with a focus on state Medicaid programs. So the number on this slide is actually wrong. There are 37 state law False Claims Act, including the District of Columbia. Um, those states have their own False Claims Act. And some state laws really just hone in on healthcare fraud and really focus on Medicaid fraud. That said, state False Claims Act provisions can be an issue for contractors, and it's something that contractors should be aware of, especially if they are selling to state and local governments uh, in those states that have the broader False Claims Act provisions. Rounding out our timeline, the False Claims Act itself was most recently amended in 2009 and then again in 2010. Um, the 2009 amendments were significant but didn't change the basic way the law functions, uh, at least the way we're going to talk about it uh, today. So if I could get to the next slide and we'll get into the crux of it. So the False Claims Act creates liability, so monetary exposure for damages uh, for any person or company who knowingly presents, that means submits, a false or fraudulent claim, which is any form of a request for payment, uh, to the United States. That is, Those are the basic provisions of the False Claims Act, and there are a number of other provisions, but this is the, the typical um, way that we think about what are the, the elements or the factors that go into a violation. So then the United States, either alone or with the help of a key TAM relator, can recover three times the amount of damages that has been caused by this conduct, by this presentation or the submission of false claims. Um, plus, there is a penalty, a civil penalty, and the penalties attach to each claim that is submitted in violation of the act. So the claim, that request for payment, is that creates the violation. If that claim is false and the person submitting it knows that the claim is false, that creates the liability. So the penalties provision can help explain why especially the healthcare fraud settlements um, can be so large because even if the claim is small, say $100 for testing that wasn't medically necessary. Um, the penalty for the submission of that false claim now starts under the, the statutory provisions and the amendments that have been made. A penalty attaches to that claim starting at roughly $10,000. Uh, and that goes up and you can imagine every claim that's submitted um, that is false, even if the, that amount is small, um, the penalty can be quite large. So some important notes here, knowingly, uh, is actually a term that is defined by the statute. It includes actual knowledge. Someone actually knows that, that there's many a claim that is false to the government. But it also includes deliberate ignorance or even reckless disregard. The notion being that um, somebody who's doing business with the government and is seeking federal funds can't just ignore a problem or issue and say, oh, I, I didn't know about that. Um, so that, that knowingly uh, requirement is fairly broad. Also, 
the government doesn't have to show that the defendant intended to defraud the government. This isn't a criminal case. This is a civil case. So that intent standard really goes to knowingly. What was in your head? What should you have known in the exercise of due diligence? Um, and it doesn't need to, so for example, the, the government doesn't care if the defendant didn't make a profit off of its False Claims Act violation. The government's concern is going to be what the government paid out that it should not have been required to pay out. Um, again, because this is an action for money damages and not a criminal violation, the government only needs to show that it is more likely than not. It is a preponderance of the evidence standard. So it is more likely than not that these elements were met. So again, in contrast to a criminal case where you would have a beyond a reasonable doubt in False Claims Act cases, um, that burden of proof, what the government has to show, uh, is uh, is reduced. It is simply, yeah, that's more like that more likely happened than didn't happen. And if we can go to the next slide, all right. So in practice, what happens? How do these cases uh, come into being? So as we discussed before. The case is filed by a whistleblower, not in all cases, but in most cases, or in a typical False Claims Act case, an individual or even a company can file a case as a whistleblower. The case is filed under seal with the court. So you can't log on to the, get onto a court's website and see that this case has been filed. The case is not served on the defendant. So there's a lawsuit pending against your company and you company aren't even aware that the, the lawsuit has been filed. So the company or the defendant doesn't know that it has been sued. The whistleblower or relator actually serves the United States. It goes to the Department of Justice. And the purpose of the sealing provision and serving the United States is because, again, the United States is ostensibly the party, the entity that has been harmed by this conduct. And the, the sealing provision and the service provision was really to make sure that the government isn't investigating the defendant for potentially criminal acts. The notion being we don't want to have a, a civil lawsuit um, be filed and all of a sudden a covert criminal investigation is exposed. So that's one of the purposes of the sealing is to avoid um, interfering with pre-existing law enforcement efforts. But also, uh, the United States is given during what's called the seal period, uh, it's a, by statute, the United States gets 60 days to look at the allegations, consider um, the case and investigate the case to see if it's a good one, to see if the government wants to put uh, government resources behind this lawsuit. Now, in practice, um, that seal period, that investigative period by the United States can be extended. So the government has to go to the court and ask for an extension, basically say we need more time to investigate and determine whether or not um, the United States should be getting into this case and pursuing this case. That investigation can go on in a typical case, uh, a case that, that has potential mer merit to it, that can go on for, for years. So for years, you have defendants who are sitting out there, they're not even aware that they have been sued. They've perhaps been sued by somebody who is still working for them or working with them, um, and the government is investigating. Um, so that period goes on for a while and um, it, it creates a lot of consternation and expense um, when you've got questions coming in from the government uh, and worry about what those unknowns are. Um, that can create a lot of issues for, for defendants, potential defendants. Ultimately, the United States, the Department of Justice, has to tell the court whether it's going to intervene, get involved in the case or not. Um, when the government intervenes in the case, basically the Department of Justice takes over and leads the, the litigation effort. Um, but the United States also has 
the option not to intervene in the case. So here's where uh, you typically see uh, settlements occurring um, and also where uh, a defendant gets an idea like, oh, this is what's going on. Um, we've been sued or there are allegations about this issue and this is, this is why the government has been after us asking for documents and things like that. Um, so at that intervention decision uh, is typically where the discussions start to begin with the defendant. Are we going to proceed with litigation or are we going to try to reach a resolution? And back to the headlines on the very first slide, note that all of those cases are settlements. Those are not court judgments against any of those companies. Um, those are agreed uh, payments by those companies to try to resolve their False Claims Act liability. So just to put some of this in perspective too, there are currently about 7,000 whistleblower actions that have been served on the United States. And the United States will actually intervene in maybe 20% of those cases. So about 1,400 cases, maybe a tad more, um, will catch the government's attention. If the government doesn't intervene in the case, the case doesn't automatically go away. It's still on the books. It's still on uh, on the court's docket. Um, the case will be unsealed, and the relator, the whistleblower, can try to proceed without the government. And typically, those cases where the government doesn't come in and take over the case, they usually don't get great big recoveries, but they can still be a big burden for defendants. So all of the activity leading up to that intervention, declination decision, uh, and then if the whistleblower decides to go forward, um, getting involved with litigation. So and finally, I'll just say on this slide, the United States can pursue False Claims Act violations on its own. Uh, the government doesn't need to wait for a whistleblower. Um, it can come out of, uh, they can file their own lawsuit. Uh, it can come out of a related investigation or referred by the criminal division, uh, or there might be an inspector general investigation or even an agency referral uh, to the Department of Justice. Let's move on to the next slide. And I knew this was going to happen. We're running out of time. So just wanted to spell out some of the reasons that the False Claims Act is significant for government contractors. The cases rarely go to trial, but the investigation can be distracting, lengthy, and the cases can be pretty complicated. The straightforward uh, contractor billed for X widgets but only delivered X minus widgets is usually the exception, not the rule in these cases. The monetary exposure can be significant, as we've seen. If a defendant goes to trial, the government has to prove its, its damage. So the, the United States Department of Justice has to explain to a jury what, what uh, was paid out that shouldn't have been paid out. And a jury would decide what the single damages are, so what the actual losses were. But under the statute, the court is then required to treble that figure. And also penalties are required if you actually go to trial and a, a judge is making the decision. Um, so just that monetary exposure alone can be pretty daunting. Um, for contractors, a False Claims Act judgment, however, so proceeding to trial, even if you could absorb the damages and the potential treble damages and potential penalties, even if that could be absorbed financially, um, a, getting a judgment can lead to suspension and debarment proceedings. So um, you know, there, there's a significant risk or a part of the, the calculation for contractors is, well, even if we have to pay an FCA judgment, um, and we could do that, uh, what's the risk to potentially losing future government business? So last slide, if I could. So here are your takeaways. The risk is high. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns. Have you been sued? Is there a whistleblower? Does the whistleblower still work for the company or work with the company? Um, the specific intent is not required there does, to create a fraud. Um, so non-compliance with a material regulation or a contract provision uh, can lead to this exposure.
um, the monetary exposure is significant, and that non-monetary exposure can be even more significant. So in our next um, Okay, thank you, Jennifer, uh, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. If anybody has any questions about today's topic, you can email her or call her at the phone number email shown on your screen. Uh, this concludes this webinar. Thank you, everybody.